And three, two, one. And welcome to Deliberation Academy. This is the first episode of our interview series. Today we have on Marcus Carrion, Lucas Carrion's brother. Uh, Marcus, would you care to give us a little brief rundown on you know who you are and where you went to school and the things that you've studied? Yeah, so I'm basically an epidemiologist. I took my degree internationally and I went to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Now I work for a local government entity as an epidemiologist working on the current outbreak. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think we're all pretty frustrated with the current situation of COVID-19. There's a lot of people who are not sure exactly what's going on and I think some of those people are concerned uh, about what the future holds in terms of policy and seeing the disease you know either grow or disappear um so we'd like to try and dispel some of the myths with you today and see what you can you know educate educate us on uh lucas do you have anything to say before we yeah no i just wanted to i just wanted to kind of just get off right off the bat and just like what are your first thoughts of like everything that's going on i've recently saw like there was new there's news popping off left and right when it comes to the COVID-19. Yeah, so Anthony Fauci actually testified in Congress, I believe it was earlier today or yesterday, um, recognizing that there's now 40,000 new cases a day on average in the United States. And we'll, you know, we'll soon be at 100,000 if we continue with the current measures that we have. Um, in order to reduce the numbers, the only way that is possible is to, you know, social distance, create quarantine orders um, right now. To so. mm. Okay. So uh, I have some questions here that I've kind of gathered up from some people just about general things. And hopefully some of these questions can expand to you explaining sort of the greater circumstances surrounding these things. Um, I think one of the first ones and most pertinent is, you know, many people are kind of upset about wearing masks. Um, I think people think it's an inconvenience, maybe it's uncomfortable, I'm not sure. Uh, but there's a, it's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, so could you tell us, you know, are masks, you know, A, are they for your own protection or are they more for the protection of others? And, you know, how effective are like homemade cloth masks versus like a, you know, a medical grade, uh, what is it, uh, N95, N95 mask? All right. So while getting into your first question, like is a mask designed to protect you or to protect someone else, there's different designs of a mask. And so... Uh, N95 is designed to protect you from other people. That's why you have a seal and you you basically have to create a firm seal so other droplets and other air particles do not come in through the side of your mask. It comes through the filtration system. So it filters out the droplet particles that carry COVID. If you're wearing a surgical mask, that's not for your own individual protection necessarily because as you inhale, you can still inhale droplets. It does reduce the area of droplets that can come into your body but it's protecting, others. it's protecting others from you. So when you exhale, now your air doesn't come out straight forward, it comes out to the side. So if you're talking to someone, it's not gonna go directly into their mouth or to their nose, or if you sneeze, it won't enter their nose or mouth. So that's the benefits of the surgical mask versus the N95. In terms of a cloth mask and the filtration system, I'm not 100% up to date on the current research of that. I do know, um, two different universities in Texas and then UC San Diego, they just did a publication about the benefits of what in social distancing. And they found out that wearing a mask, a cloth face covering is more beneficial than social distancing on its own. I don't know the statistical odds or the rates of how beneficial it was off the top of my head, but I do know that it was significant difference. Okay, and to kind of expand on that, uh, could you, Give us some insight onto you know how long can it like live in the air or on hard surfaces? Oh, those are some good questions. Um, I'm not 100% up to date on the current research of that. I do know depending on the surface, it can live on multiple surfaces for different amounts of time. Right? On some surfaces, it might be able to survive two hours. I've seen articles where it's been able to survive up to 20 hours. I've also I think like. In terms of living on different materials is very important, right? Because as you go throughout your day, you're touching different things, and then you're going to touch your face, and you're going to touch your nose and your mouth, and that's how you can transmit it to yourself. Not from an infected person, but I also think going back to the mask conversation, when someone sneezes, the coronavirus can travel 
a significant amount of feet. I'm not going to tell you the number right now because I do want you to guess how far you think the coronavirus can travel when you sneeze. Oh, I don't know. Maybe 12 11 feet. feet. 11, 11, yeah. 25 feet. Holy <laughs> moly. <laughs> so this goes back to the important mask as I was saying, right? So if you're wearing a surgical mask when you sneeze, your sneeze is now diverted. It's not able to travel the full 25 feet. And if you're wearing a surgical mask, it's going out to the sides. If you're wearing a cloth mask, it's going to be absorbed into the cloth. Okay. Wow. So, so masks are actually really important is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, and it's, so not a, you, it's not a myth. Mm -hmm. They dramatically mm -hmm. reduce the distance that it can travel. Yeah. Through and the there, there is a debate with the mask within the scientific science community, you know, like being in science, you're, you defend like the current science of what it is. But then when you find new science and how it favors a different opinion as a scientist, it's easy for you to kind of like, oh, well, this is what literally the science is telling us. So this is what we need to do. Right. So you're saying that you're so, actually. Okay. Yeah. To kind of expand on PPE a little bit. Oh, sorry, Lucas, what were you saying? Oh, uh, no, no, you could go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, w I wanted to expand on the personal protective equipment conversation just a little bit more. Um, I, I've spoken with some people who, who are concerned that, you know, they need to wear goggles when they go outside or gloves. Um, could you, could you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah, you know, so what are the main ports of entry for the disease? So with that, I'm going to get into PP for a little bit. So, you know, as in school, we're taught in public health, PP is your last line of defense. You should have policies in order and guidelines in place before PPE is even a topic of conversation. It's is literally really last line of defense to prevent you from being injured in a workplace from getting infected. So with that, gloves, gloves, there's a debate, and I've heard an argument that I do agree with. When you're wearing a glove, you're conscious of your hands, you're conscious of where you're touching, particularly your face, your And if you're conscious of wearing that, now you're not deliberately touching your face. So that reduces your odds of transmission. So that's a benefit. Now, as you're touching things and you're wearing your gloves, you can still get the virus on your glove. It can be there. You have to dispose of it properly. You should be trained on how to dispose of a glove. You should wash your hands afterwards. And it's important to not think, oh, because I'm wearing a glove, I'm not going to get the virus. You know, you don't want to touch your face. You don't want to wear gloves at the supermarket. Go get into your car. You're driving. You get into your car. You start your car. You put it in drive. You, you're using the steering wheel, and you still have your gloves on. That's complete cross-contamination. And if the virus is on you, now you just put it all over your car. It can live in your car for a period of time. It can get onto your other clothes. And if you're not disinfecting the area, it can live and thrive until it dies naturally. Okay. Uh, so, again, with, you know, sort of contaminating surfaces or other people. Uh, do you know, could you explain, you know, how long can you have this virus before you can transmit it to others? And uh, how long can you have it before you experience symptoms? Yeah, so that to like the infectious period and serial intervals. So with that, you know, there's some people who, who we say are asymptomatic, meaning they don't have any symptoms. Now that person, if they test positive for COVID, there's ev scientific evidence that shows that they can infect people. So you can pass it along while you're fully ha healthy and well, just like we are right now. One of us could be infected, passing it on to others. Now with that, we use the guidelines. Um, if someone's asymptomatic, we say that they can be infectious for 10 days. So that's kind of the period where we want them to isolate. And isolation is like, you know, going into your room of the house where you have your own separate space and staying there. You're going to have as least interaction with the rest of your household as possible because you don't want to transmit to the rest of your household. And so, so, <laughs> so it, you would have to be isolated for a minimum of 10 days. And if any of those days do not have a fever, then you would still be isolated for those 10 days. Now, if you're symptomatic, you have symptoms, you would still be isolated for 10 days. And three of those days would have to be without a fever. So if your fever goes away on that seventh day, on that 10th day, and you still have no fever, you are now considered not to be infectious. But you know, you can have a fever up until the 10th day, and then on the 13th day, maybe not have a fever anymore. So then you're considered not to be infectious, or it could be the 15th day, the 18th day. And we're seeing situations where people are in the hospital, you know, for a month, maybe a month and a half to two months. 
And right. if they're having a fever during that entire time and they're severely symptomatic, they're still infectious. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, so, um, okay. Can I go ahead and ask the, the next one? Um, yeah, go ahead. In terms of like, you know, like the politicians open back the economy up, whether you agree with it or disagree, um, you know, like you're an epidemiologist, like what do you think um, should have been done or what, how was it, was it operate, like, was it done according to your guys' guidance? Um, if not, like what, what happened and like, what do you think should happen going forward from here? Um, yeah, I, I do think local governments need to work closely with their health departments. They need to listen to the guidance and they should uphold it as much as possible. You know, with any type of guidance, any individual can take away from it what they want. If they use 100% of it, they use 100% of it. If they use 5%, they use 5%. So it is our guidance. It's not written into stone and we would hope that they would follow it as closely as possible. In terms of reopening, I do think it, 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 it's reopening can happen. Currently right now with what we're seeing with the amount of cases, we do need to start closing places and limit environments to reduce um, how many people are getting infected per day and to reduce the reproductive number. So that's my personal stance on it. I do think that we need to close down. Uh, when people decided to reopen, I do think larger public places like shopping malls and department stores obviously generate revenue. And I don't know if you're aware, like local governments receive their, um, their yearly revenue based off of sales tax. So right now sales tax is significantly down. So local governments like counties and cities are severely underfunded and counties all over the nation are facing severe deficits. So that's also like, you know, we're, we're motivated to reopen the city and the counties as well, but we have to do it safely. And so when large department stores open, it's difficult to do contact tracing. You have people that go in there. Yes, they might be social distancing and wearing a mask, but in order to, let's say, one of the employees at a large department store test positive and they interacted with 20 different customers that day, how are we able to notify those individual customers that they've came in contact with a confirmed case? It's very challenging versus, let's say, like hairdressers who you know, weren't allowed to open until fairly recently they have a client-based system where they know their individuals and they're only seeing one client at a time. You can arrange the chairs in a social distancing manner and it's very easy to you know, do contact tracing. If a hairdresser tests positive for COVID or if one of their clients do, there's a notification process and we can say like, hey, like, what are the names of the other clients you saw in this X amount of time? We can easily obtain that list and we can go and issue them quarantine orders to for 14 days to make sure that they didn't get infected to stop the trains of transmission. So it's all, it's about learning and adapting what large places can open or which places can open large or small and which ones can't. So do you think that we're going to be locked down again, hardcore, um, you know, in the near future? Um, now that's definitely a politically loaded question and it depends on what politicians want. Like, if you want to control this virus and you want to get things under control, you want the reproductive number to be one or to be below one, yeah, you do need to lock down. And even if we lock down to the extent right now to only get R naught to one, currently we're seeing 40,000 new cases in the United States a day. So with a reproductive number of one, that means every case leads to one case. So we would see a trend of 40,000 new cases a day. Is that sustainable? I don't personally think that's sustainable at all. So you would want to get that reproductive numbers below one to a manageable level of where we're maybe seeing, you know, nationally, I don't want to give a number, locally in a large city is probably around, I would be comfortable with 100 or less cases a day in a large metropolitan city to where, you know, you're only having 100 cases a day. It's manageable where you can isolate and contact trace them. Um, but we have a long way to go until we can get there, unfortunately. Awesome. So, uh, in in talking about you know a number of new cases and um, you know the spread of the disease, there's been a lot of talk from a lot of people saying, you know, why are we so concerned about this? If you look at other things like the flu, you know, seasonal flu, or, you know, some people are talking about like the Spanish flu or so 
many other diseases, right? And they're making the case that, you know, it's not that big of a deal when you look at these other cases that are around all the time that we already deal with. Um, so is this, could, could you go into explaining, you know, is this actually, you know, more deadly than some of these things? Or are there other factors that contribute to the general picture? Because, you know, maybe we're more mobile now, we're more populated. So we're oh, yeah, totally. with so... more people. Getting into like global pandemics, I recently was reading articles and looking at discussions and the last like blue bonnet plague and Spanish flu, a large of a lot of them revolve around like global and international trade. So when we saw the pandemics emerge like in Europe, it was because of the trade routes with Asia. So that's what carried the virus. And so like right now we're seeing this blow up into a pandemic largely because of air travel. You know, like people travel to Asia all the time. They travel to Europe all the time. They travel to Brazil, South America, um, the Middle East. And so that's why we're seeing such a, a spread so rapidly. But it's also like the balance of how infectious this is. Now, it's not super infectious as something like the measles, which is not necessarily our benefit, right? Because if it's super infectious, then a larger number of people will become infected at a certain point in time they're so sick or there's they're so sick and they're in one central area where they're not moving globally they're not traveling they don't feel well so i think like one of the major things is you can transmit this infection while being asymptomatic with other illnesses that's not necessarily the case you can be sympt your most most infectious diseases you are symptomatic and you're passing it that way now you also brought up a good point with the flu but you did say one key word you said seasonal the flu is seasonal we do have cases year-round but we do have seasonal spikes and it mutates every single year that's just the way the flu functions but we know by a certain point of the year our cases decrease with coronavirus that's not the case at all i mean we're entering summer right now and you can see that the cases are just increasing and a good indicator would have been like looking at countries that were below the equator when we were in our summertime and an example of that would be Brazil. Brazil's below the equator. When we were in our winter, it was their summer. Brazil was blowing up their cases. They have, I don't know how many cases they have now, but they, it's, there's a significant amount. It's, there's a lot and in other countries below the equator as well. So seasonality was not, shouldn't have been a topic of conversation in my opinion. I think that was like phased out a long time ago. And I think a lot of the reopening from politicians were betting on seasonality. They're just like, we can open, um, it's seasonal, we're gonna see a decrease. But at the same time, when we did decide to open, we never really saw our cases going down. We kind of plateaued. So in terms of like an epi curve, we're still kind of at the top. Are we gonna go down or are we gonna go up? We don't know. Right now we're going up, obviously, because there's more cases. So was that a smart move? It was their, their decision ultimately. Um, I don't agree with it, but that's what it was. Right. So, yeah. So since you said you don't agree with it, what would you have advised, like if you, you know, for your local politicians to, to do? Well, I mean, so like in the city I live in, we were still seeing a thousand cases a day when we decided to reopen. With an R naught of one, well, when we opened our, our R, our reproductive number was below one. So we were on a downward, a little downward trend, but on average, we were still seeing a thousand cases a day. Now, if the reproductive number was to one, we would still see a thousand cases a day. How sustainable is that long term? Up for debate and time would tell, you know, we don't really have the answers to that. But if we were able to get the average number of new cases a day to around a hundred, that's completely more manageable. I mean, the city that I live mm -hmm. in, we have a population of 10 million people. 10 million well, people. Well, what about for those who want to do herd immunity? Um, <laughs> and could you also explain the concept of herd yeah, immunity? Yeah, and, and the concept of herd immunity, please. Yeah, so basically, um, there's two ways to get to herd immunity. You can either get to herd immunity through a natural infection by building up antibodies in your system and that's by acquiring the infection. And so for those people that get COVID, they have antibodies. How long do those antibodies last in their system? It's up for debate. How many antibodies do you need to be immune to this? Up for debate as well. It still needs to be scientifically proven. The other method to get to herd immunity is through vaccines. And so with that, you calculate herd immunity by R naught, which is the basic reproductive number, minus one over R naught. 
So current research suggests that the reproductive number is anywhere between two or three. So we can do a simple calculation, three minus one over three would be two over three. So roughly 67% of individuals would either have to have the infection and have enough antibodies to sustain to where we are at a manageable level, or we would have to have that percentage of people in combination with having natural infection be vaccinated. Currently, there's no vaccine, so that's not up for a, for a topic of conversation. On a national level, do you currently know how many people are infected? Are I don't know. Uh, make a guess. 500,000? Okay, so roughly 2.7 million. Oh, wow. wow. Do you know the size of the U.S. population? Something billion, seven billion? No, I don't, so no, I don't know. Three, 350 million or something like that? 328 million. Yeah. So if we wanted to do a proportion of the United States citizens that would have been infected, we would take the total number of coronavirus cases so far over the total population size. When we do that, we get 2 million divided by 328 million. Uh, you know, we can approximate roughly 0.8% of the population has been infected. <laughs> and uh, we need 66. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, you, so you're telling me that there's like a 65 percentage uh, points that yeah. we have to do to get to herd immunity. Yeah. So what I'm so. saying is we're a severely long way from that. And as public health officials, if we are working to get to herd immunity, if that's our, I mean, ultimately you want to get to herd immunity through other means like with vaccines and whatnot to have a virus completely under control. But if that's our end goal at this moment, we're almost setting ourselves up for failure because there's other methods that we can go about to control this outbreak and to eliminate the modes of transmission. Mm -hmm. and right. so, and, and what, what do you say to the people that, that this is not a very deadly virus, you know, because uh, that's what we're, we are seeing. They're, they don't care. They're, they're not wearing their virus. But as we also have seen that 99% of these people haven't even been in contact with this virus. It's an issue as well why it's not as deadly. If this virus was more deadly, it would slow down transmission and we wouldn't have as much people being infected. I know it's like a weird concept to think of, but when we think about the individuals that are susceptible or when you, it is so deadly, right? If this was a really deadly illness, we could go to Ebola. You get so sick, you stay in your house or you go to the hospital and you don't move. So you're not infecting a large amount of other people. You're not healthy moving around and infecting people. And then you die, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So you're, so that mode of transmission is just stopping. Yeah, it, it just gets eliminated. Yeah, but so now, but it, now it, since this one stays alive, it has the potential to, to do more damage because it's yeah, been, and you're it stays you're out have longer. The, well, you have the ability to infect more people with more people being infected. You know, everyone, you can't say what your health outcome is. We all have different risk factors. We all have different comorbidities mm -hmm. that, you know, predict our health outcomes. But who's to say at the end of the day, you can be a healthy 25 year old, get this, have severe negative health outcomes and maybe consequently die from it. We don't know. Which is very possible. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that already. So, so basically your main takeaway from here is that most Americans who were like, cause a lot of people think they may have had COVID. Like, you know, I wasn't even tested yet. I haven't tested myself yet. I know I probably should be more responsible to go get tested, but like, Sometimes in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, maybe that one time where I had a, a random sneeze, that was COVID. And I know I've, I've talked to a lot of people and they, they come, come up with similar conclusions. Well, if you haven't been tested for it, how do you know you've had it? I mean, we can get mm -hmm. inside our brains and psych ourselves out like, oh, my throat feels sore today. Oh, I have a fever. These are all risk factors for COVID. They're also risk factors for the cold. How do you differentiate between having the cold and having the flu based off of your symptoms without a test? It's nearly impossible, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've interviewed multiple people who have had COVID doing our contact tracing, doing our guidance. And the way a large majority of people who do have severe symptoms explain this, like, I don't want it. I don't want right. it all. Being told, oh, I feel like glass or razor blades are ripping through my esophagus. Like, doesn't paint a good picture for me. I don't want it. <laughs> have you ever had right. strep throat? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> So, so, oh, so in, in terms of talking about, you know, continuing the conversation about infection and communicating this disease, uh, if you get the disease, can you get it again? Do we know? Only time can tell the answer to that. So currently we do not know 
is this virus a seasonal thing like the flu that's going to mutate every year where you can get reinfected? Or is it similar to maybe chicken pots where you get it once in your life and you acquire immunity to it? We don't have the research to back up either answer yet. Okay. Uh, so I have one more question that I wanted to get out there. So there's a lot of discussion about, you know, vaccinations coming out and different medications being used to treat COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the world today, just based on conversations I've had with several people, people don't necessarily understand how these medications work. And one of the topics that comes up is antibiotics. And I think this is kind of important. I don't understand fully the science, but I do understand that bacterial infections are separate from viral infections that, that at their core, they're different types of things. One is right. actually a small organism and one is like a code of RNA floating through space. Um, but I think that there are some people who believe that taking antibiotics that they may have saved up over this you know, period of time is somehow going to protect them or cure this disease. Uh, could you go into, you know, why is it difficult to find a vaccination and why these medications are probably not actually effective treatments if they're not uh, yeah. for this disease? So I'm not a virologist, but I will get into this a little bit. So basically using antibiotics, let's say you had strep throat, you were prescribed amoxicillin, you took five days worth of your medication, generally you'll get a 10 day um, supply. After the fifth day, you started feeling better and you're like, hey, I don't need my medication anymore. Well, those ideas and that behavior does lead to antibiotic resistance, which is a huge major issue that we're having and we'll probably, you know, within our lifetime see issues arise from that as well, where different antibiotics have full resistance and we're no longer able to use them anymore. So you definitely don't want to be like, oh, hey, I have some extra antibiotics. Let me pop them in my mouth and I'll feel better. That's not going to work. Um, as you mentioned, this is a virus. And so generally we do not use antibiotics to treat viruses as well. So yeah, in terms of finding a treatment, that's definitely like EP epidemiology study designs. We can do clinical trials to really figure out what medications are effective, but we also get into a lot of ethical issues with that because with a new emerging illness, it's like, how do we know this medication is going to help you? Or how do we know it's not gonna harm you? So there's a lot of resistance probably to explore and to do the research because what happens when we do prescribe you a medication that we have a hypothesis, it's gonna help you and make you feel better, right? And we do an odds ratio and we find out that your odds of dying are significantly higher by receiving this medication than if you wouldn't have had it to begin with. So right. there, there's issues with that. And I understand like the skept when it's like skeptical and whatnot, but with research, I mean, you, we would discover cures, we discover treatments and a vaccine can, you know, it can be developed. It's gonna take some time, has to go through the proper channels, clinical trials. You can't just jump and say like, hey, this vaccine worked and cured this one person. Let's go off and mass vaccine everyone. It worked without a clinical trial, you know. It's possible that even with a vaccine being developed during this clinical trial, we start to see like really bad health outcomes. And we're just like, hey, this vaccine, our current cocktail does cure you from coronavirus, but now your odds or having X cancer or different negative health outcomes do increase. And it's like, I'm hesitant to also say this because I'm not, I don't want to like feel anti vaxxer fire or whatnot, but there, there's just a lot of unknowns. Right. So uh, with the time remaining, is there anything that you think is pertinent for people to know that we haven't addressed already? Um, I think it's important to know for people to realize that coronavirus is here. And, you know, I've mentioned that only 0.8% of the United States so far has been infected. So with that, you know, seeing friends and family that are infected, your odds of seeing that are low. And so you, this makes people believe, oh, it's fabricated by the media. It's made up, you know, it's not as bad as it's going to get or whatever. But in order to get to that, like, you know, herd immunity threshold, how bad it can get, we're talking 67%. That's over 50% of people. If you live in a household with four people, we're talking about you know two or three of those people being infected. And potentially dying. 
yeah, and potentially dying. So, and then one of the things that we did see in China is a lot of the top healthcare professionals ended up dying, right? Well, the healthcare professionals died. Yeah, the whistleblowers, and you know, we can get into it about like the personal protective gear of healthcare individuals being infected, of how you know it's the last line of defense and it wasn't effective, or some nurses, you know, there's reports of them not being given the proper personal protective gear, given a surgical mask instead of an N95, and they're having to do that, that definitely increases their chances of contracting COVID. And no one can say like, oh, you're a perfectly healthy 27 year old nurse. You work out five times a week, you won't have bad health problems. Like we, we can't say that, it's all on an individual basis. And with that, like, we're gonna get to a point if we're having 100,000 cases a day where it's going to be completely unmanageable. You're not going to be able to get tested because we won't have the testing capacity to test that amount of people. We also, if people need to be hospitalized, we're going to have to make makeshift hospitals in different settings. We're going to have to find more doctors and nurses that are already overworked from this pandemic to now recruit more. Do we pull from, you know, recent gra like graduating class of nurses or doctors who, you know, they focus in school and they're highly skilled, but they don't have the years of experience of someone who's been in the profession for 10 years. You know, you acquire that by working. Or do we encourage those who are older, who have retired, who are doctors and nurses to come out of retirement and work? Um, with that, you're encouraging an older demographic of people who are at higher risk of negative health outcomes to work. And if they get infected, the chances of them having bad health outcomes are significantly higher. So, I mean, either way, it's, you have to pick your battle of which way you want to go, so, yeah. On that, on that thought, um, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about reopening places such as schools. Um, what, and uh, somebody, somebody brought up a, an interesting concern to me, which is, you know, a lot of, like, colleges, you live in a dormitory, right? Uh, what would you say... What, what, what are your thoughts on that and reopening this kind of space where you're packing in large populations of people into a dormitory style living space? Yeah, so with that with schools, you know, when you say schools, I know you focus right now on institutes of higher education like colleges, but with schools, you know, we also have to talk about daycare centers, um, pre-K, kindergarten, Elementary school, middle school, high school, like what does that all look like? I know in the younger age groups we're seeing, you know, they're not being impacted as much as older demographics of people or even middle aged people. The transmission just really isn't there. And that's what the current research is showing is the research showing that because they're not in school and they're not currently around each other. So we're not seeing the transmission. Or is that what it actually is? And it's an ethical concern, like, right? Like we can allow these people to go back to school, but what happens when they start getting infected? what's our procedures and you know i'm helping to build those guidelines right now of our protocols and what we're going to do in the school-based settings and especially like in institutes of higher education every college depending what health district they're in they have to follow the state and local guidance how how are they going to word the materials are they going to be specific and literally mandate and say bullet point by bullet point what needs to be done or are we going to word the material to be vague in order to accommodate large and smaller institutions? You know, it's, it's very challenging to work with such a large demographic of people and to control that type of environment. I personally, you know, and when we talk about dorm rooms and colleges, every, there's different types of designs. You can have a dorm room where it's apartment style, or you can literally have your own bedroom on a long hallway and you have a communal bathroom. If someone gets infected, we're currently mandating that they have to have an have an area to isolate in order to not infect their other um, floor mates or flatmates or roommates. Are we going to get to a point where that's still manageable, where there's enough rooms? We'll only know by reopening and seeing the current trends. But it's definitely a challenge. Even having roommates, I know like my freshman year of college and undergrad, I was forced into a triple, a forced triple. So it was a room designed for two people and now you have three people living in it. You know, you're in close proximity, you're breathing. If I get infected, my chances of infecting another roommate and transmitting that asymptomatically are quite high. We can quickly have our reproductive number increase and run out of isolation spaces. So it's definitely a concern. 
we're working through it, but at the same time, if we're at a point within our cities or counties or larger states and districts where that reproductive number is so small, where we are seeing, you know, 100 cases a day with a population of 10 million, it's manageable. If, right. if you know, 10 of those cases are at a college, it's manageable. We can handle it. We don't have to get to a point where we literally have zero cases a day in the U.S. or any other major city. We have to get to a point where it's manageable, where we can contain it, where our policies, our guidelines, our contact tracing works. Right now, we're at a point where it's unmanageable. You know, it's like a hard word to say and it's hard to admit, but we are at an unmanageable point. Contact tracing can only do so much. It's only so effective. If we're having, you know, 3,000 cases a day in a local city and having to do contact tracing, having to confirm labs, having to find all those contacts, each person probably has anywhere between three to five contacts, notifying those people, having them quarantine. It's a big task. It requires a very large team of people. And jumping through the channels of even getting the confirmed lab, there is a time delay to get that case count. You know, like you go to the doctors, you go through your drive-through um, testing site or wherever you're getting tested, that lab then needs to collect that specimen, process that specimen, confirm if it's negative or positive, send it to the public health entity, also notify you that you tested positive to immediately isolate. It, it's, it's a process and there's a bunch of time delays. So. It's, it's definitely a really challenging task. Um, universities, I would like to encourage them to do as much online classes as possible. I know it's challenging with people who are in the STEM field and you need your labs, I get it. Um, finding adaptive ways to provide that is a necessity and it's something that needs to be discussed with policy guidelines and your local health officials. But at the same time, like, you know, when we're talking about large institutions, large education facilities, a lot of them are research-based facilities. They have epidemiologists who are training the next generation of epidemiologists. They have virologists who are training the next generation of virologists. They're doing the research. They're innovators in their field. And you know, I encourage them to be more vocal and to say what their thoughts are and what's going on. And it's like, if we need to do contact tracing at smaller universities or large inner universities or colleges, those are like small cities. You know, like the health department, we we are a team and you know like there's a lot of us but there's not enough of us to go around we can only do so much and i encourage like the local universities to hire their recent graduates or graduating class to educate them on this pandemic and to educate them about contact tracing and the policy forms and guidelines and the procedures of what goes in place because you know working for a local government agency as this continues we're going to have to hire more people we're going to want to hire people that are trained that understand what's going on and if those people have it, you know, they check our boxes and we're gonna to wanna to work with them. I mean, we'll definitely still hire those that don't have the same skills and the same training. But um, in a pandemic, you have to go with who has the knowledge and who has the skills and can help you in that moment. Right. So you talk about uh, contact tracing and reporting quite a lot. Um, so a concern that I, I've, I've gleaned from some people is, you know, in, in coronavirus reporting, um, some people are not super sure that it was coronavirus that necessarily killed these people, especially because they're saying, you know, well, you, in able to actually have a chance of death, you need to have several underlying conditions. Uh, could you maybe explain a little bit about, you know, is it, is coronavirus on its own deadly? Um, you know, do underlying conditions play a major contributing factor, um, you know, is there a chance you're going to die without con in any of these underlying uh, health problems? Yeah, and so with that, I mean, we got to look at the science and the statistics and the models. Um, I'm not fully up to date on the most current information, the scientific information, but with that, like, you can die at any moment from anything, and the more comorbidities you have, and comorbidities are basically negative health risk factors, obesity, um, diabetes, smoking, different things like that, that do contribute to negative health outcomes. Now, this is a respiratory, it, um, coronavirus does affect your respiratory, so it affects your breathing. I mean, if you have asthma, if you're obese, if you smoke, you're already reducing, your lung capacity is already reduced. So what does that, how does that affect it? Only the research is gonna tell. And right now, like, 
you know, I encourage large research institutions to start acquiring data and to run those models that tell us who's most at risk, what um, variables, you know, most impact us. And so currently I'm not aware of any current scientific literature that tells us like, oh, like the, if you have diabetes, you're at a significantly higher odds of ha dying from COVID. Like I don't, we don't have the data or the models to say that, but we can say the more comorbidities you have, the higher risk you have of dying and a negative health outcome. That's for sure. And that shows like with any other illness or any other disease, that's what we do know. Thank you. Lucas, do you have anything? Um, I think that that pretty much answered, you know, the, the very important questions out there, which were like, what should we do going forward? Should we wear a mask? Is this virus real? I think we covered, you know, many of the major problems that what we're seeing oh, yeah. in society well, right now. Wear a mask, virus is real. And definitely practice your social distancing. I am definitely, you know, the holidays are coming up, summer's coming up, and there's so many different health concerns we have. With that, um, you know, it's not a great idea to have backyard parties for 4th of July. What happens when you start infecting your close family members? And, you know, we all have family members of different age groups. What happens when grandma or grandpa gets infected and we can do contact tracing to identify, like, hey, this person is the Ambet's case at this party and they infected grandma and grandma dies. You know, like, that what, that's what can happen. <laughs> it, it could tear apart American society is what you're suggesting. To some extent, you know, to because some extent, like, I mean, like, who's to say what harm it can do, but we Yeah, have, but just knowing you potentially killed grandma is pretty scary. Well, yeah, I mean, there's so many, like, psychological impacts that that can have on you as a person. Right. So. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, do you have uh, any final words or any final thoughts or concerns? Um, I would say, how do I word it? You know, in order to have this outbreak under control, I think like more public health officials need to be more vocal. We need to, as epidemiologists or like other virologists need to come forward and literally say like, what's happening? More so, I, I, I know like governors and local health public officials are doing that on a daily, but um, it's like providing America with their options. So are we to a point where this is just so unmanageable where we have to do like mass lockdown where like, look, we do not have the capacity to put people in the hospital, let alone test to identify. We don't want to be like that. Um, or do, are we like upfront and honest and be like, hey, this is getting a little bit out of control. These are our benchmarkers. When this happens, know that these places are going to close. And so that's like a more pragmatic model and more pragmatic way to do it. You're being, in my opinion, you're being more honest with the American people. You're laying out their options. And I think we also have to do more work and encourage like places like grocery stores. You know, everyone needs food, but do you necessarily need to go into a grocery store in order to obtain your food? These are major places of transmission, you know? So right. I, I encourage like different grocery stores design like mobile pickups or something where this, your employees can be there if they're social distancing from other people and they're around the same people, contact tracing is fairly easy. And if they go out and do the shopping and then you drive up and cart pick up or whatever and they put the bags in your car, that limits modes of transmission. So different things like that that we haven't even tried yet or maybe we have tried in other areas of the world or the US and looking at how effective that is and how practical it is. Well, right. I, I got one last important question, I think that everybody really wants to hear, yeah. which is uh, if we actually did do listen to the epidemiologists, how soon can we potentially get this under control? Well, I mean, like, we can do predictive modeling to see, like, hey, if we did full-on quarantine measures, this is what our policies are, this is what our guidelines are. We can do, like, a predictive modeling to see what our reproductive numbers would be, and we can do, like, maybe a time frame analysis to see, like, okay, at this length of time, we'll be able to reopen to this X amount capacity. Um, I think that's personally what we should be doing. I think we need to get to a point where we do have mass lockdown again. Uh, I know that makes people very concerned and makes people panic. And 
you know, from an overall arching point, we all want things to be open. I don't want things to be closed. I want things to be open. I want the economy to go back to normal. I want things to be able to function, but we're at three months of this mediocre lockdown where it was not locked down enough. So we didn't have, we had things under control, but not to the under control of the way that we should have. So. And then the protests know. happen and then the, 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 the yeah, Trump, the Trump rallies and, 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 and all of this is coming. It's just hitting us at once and we may see a real up, you know, spike well, in coronaviruses. Yeah, my personal opinion, like once we started seeing large mass gatherings in public places, like we on a state, local level, or even um, national level, there should have been lockdowns imposed and we should not have been proceeding with reopening. You know, that's my personal opinion. Um, someone can debate me on it and argue with me on it all day and it's fine. Um, it, but you're just, you're talking, stance. you're talking about a strictly epidemiologist point of view. And could you remind me again, what a, exactly an epidemiologist is? Because most people, a lot of people don't know what, know what they are. Yeah. So an epidemiologist, basically we study diseases and the patterns of diseases. And so we can do different modeling of communicable diseases or non-communicable diseases. So basically you're specifically trained to prevent the disease yeah. from getting out of control. Yeah. So you want, to, you want to contain, you're the guy people talk to to contain the disease. So, 100%. so normal life resumes. Yeah. yeah. And okay. So basically you're saying we should potentially lock down for a little bit to, to for so a little bit you have to do it to a point to where you know like we're at forty thousand cases a day right now i don't know what the reproductive number is currently you know anthony fauci recently said that we'll be at a hundred thousand cases soon you know a hundred thousand cases can easily go to one hundred and twenty thousand cases maybe one hundred and fifty thousand cases we'll get to a point where it's completely unmanageable and, and we won't say, even be doing uh, what's it called anymore testing anymore yeah. because it's it'll just be overwhelmed I mean, we'll still be doing testing. It's like, we're going to have to create more restrictive testing where we're not going to be able to test everyone. We'll have to do like, okay, you have to meet these check marks in order to mm -hmm. get tested for approval. Are you a first responder? Or do you have these symptoms? Such. Um, it'll make things severely more complicated. You're going to overwhelm hospitals. You're going to overwhelm the public health department. Uh, it's, it's going to be very, very frustrating, and we're going to get to a point where we'll have to be locked down regardless. So do you want to get to the point where it's completely unmanageable and lockdown is our last resort? Or would you rather be upfront with the American people and say, like, hey, it's getting out of control. We need to do a lockdown. We can give you certain time frames of when it's going to happen. And, you know, a lockdown doesn't necessarily have to be on a national level. It can be on a state level. It can be on a county level, a city level. You, like, local government has the ability to do that. And it's possible. You know, right now in Connecticut and in New York, we're seeing travel restrictions. Anyone coming, I think, now to Connecticut or New York from 14 plus different states are mandated to quarantine for 14 days, meaning they have to stay in their hotel rooms or houses and they can't leave, you know? And I'm sure they're is issuing health officer orders and that basically is a quarantine order. And when you violate it, there are legal ratifications from it. So right. we're already seeing like different states implement that. And I, I, I honestly, I encourage it because we're seeing other states who are taking this seriously, doing containment measures, managing it, and other states who aren't and not every state receives the same amount of funding has the same amount of trained staff and you know rural places are going to function differently than urban places and yeah so given you know our current way of trying to handle this uh which it sounds like we're not really doing quite enough what how long could you say we might be dealing with this given we don't you know address it properly versus if we were to address this properly what would that time frame look like because you, you know you brought up you know bringing giving people their options and trying to say like look here's an option here's an option you know if we did maximum total lockdown like closed state boundaries and everything what would that how soon would be able to get out of this versus you know if we keep doing things the way that we are how long could we potentially be dealing with this problem yeah so um 
I don't have a rough number off the top of my head, but you would want to get that reproductive number to something manageable. You know, like I said, like, you know, I'm just throwing 100 cases a day out there in a population of 10 million. The R naught from that is probably like significantly low. It's probably like around 0.1 or 0.2. Uh, really low, really manageable, even something probably around like 0.25 or even up to 0.5. What that is, um, on a population level, I'm not entirely sure. I have to do the math behind it to find out. But we would have to have enough time in quarantine and isolation in order to get it to that point. Now, if everyone is in compliance and you completely stop the modes of transmission, and I'm like, I'm talking like actual like lockdown, not like, oh, you're kind of locked down, but I don't really know what it means. So I don't know if I'm allowed to go into work or not go into work, but like my job's still functioning and they still want me to go. So I'm still going in. Like that's kind of like what happened here. So those are issues. We need to, you know, have a little bit of stricter guidelines and policies in place to really do have that lockdown to where you're totally stopping the modes of transmission. With that, you're kind of like freezing the reproductive number to saying like, okay, those that are infected or in a household that do have someone infected, it is challenging and their risk of infected still happens. But let's say you do a complete quarantine, no one in your household is infected. You're now no longer going out. Your chances of being infected are significantly low. With so that, you're, you're bringing everything under control. You're no longer having as the amount of transmission as you would and you're stopping it. You're able to isolate, you're able to contain, and you're able to identify those who have it, their close contacts, and you were at a manageable level. Right. So g given the current state of things, do you think that this problem could persist for quite a long time? Yeah, so I'm gonna go back to like the percent of the US population that's currently infected, 0.8%, and in order to get to herd immunity, meaning like once herd immunity happens, the, there's enough antibodies in people to prevent others from getting sick. Those modes of transmission aren't there anymore. It doesn't really happen. Or if someone is infected, it's not gonna blow up into something crazy. Um, so we're at 0.8% of current US population being infected. We need to get to 67%. So yeah, 65% of people need to be infected or have some type of antibodies in order to get to that point. Okay. Yeah. So we have any, we have any, if we've never, we've never even experienced 1%, let alone what it's like, like 3% looks like. Well, it's also like, that's completely on a national level, right? We can look right. at different major cities, calculate what so different major cities are hit hard. So New York city is going to have a higher um, likelihood of being closer to herd immunity. Yeah. Depending on what their population is and how many people have been infected. I know like, Oh, I think New York has some of the highest case counts in all the U.S. So Okay, got it. So they have, they're, they're have a higher. So then this brings us back to the problem that what we were talking about, Mark, is basically that the, the people are going to have to stay inside for approximately at least a month, maybe longer. And like they're talking about capitalism's inability to essentially freeze credit to deal with this problem. Because the reason why we're getting this push to try to reopen the economy, why the epidemiologists are seeing such pushback is because the, the, they need to get people working together. Uh, again, to get the economy going. So that way they don't default on their houses and they don't default on their car payments and they don't default on all of their credit card payments and everything. That this system is, is keeping, it's, it's forcing everything to keep the wheels spinning and we kind of just right. need to pump the brakes. Right. So right. I think that that's kind of where yeah. we're at right now. Uh, I think we're really starting to like identify like these real problems and uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't have any last minute questions for you, Marcus. You got any? last minute things mark final closing statement yeah i think that that's a good good summary um it was great having you on marcus i right. look forward to maybe talking to you again soon um all right more discussions um, all yeah right, bye. Uh, all right bye